Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Anna Patero. I'm the coach and director of forensics of the speech and debate team here at Solano Community College. And on behalf of the dean of the School of Liberal Arts, Neil Glines, our coaching staff, Darren Phelan and Brian Nelson, and our speech and debate team, I'd like to welcome you all to speech night. I know that many, if not most of you, are here for extra credit, but I'd like to thank you all for supporting our team, who will be our nationally ranked speech and debate team, who will be representing Solano Community College in Cleveland, Ohio, in two weeks at our national championship tournament. The events that you're going to see here is a little bit of something for everybody. If you're taking interpretation of literature, you'll get to see a duo interpretation, which you'll probably be doing in your classes. You'll also get to see a programmed oral interpretation interpretation this evening for that class as well. If you're taking Communication Studies 1, you'll get to hear an informative and a persuasive speech. When you're, if you're taking notes, what I'd like for you to focus on for the informative and persuasive speeches is the structure, the content, how they cite their sources, because you'll have to do that in your speeches as well, and the, their delivery. What do you think of their delivery? If you're in Communication Studies 6, which is argumentation and debate, you should have a flow sheet, and you should have a ballot. You're going to fill out that flow sheet, flow the debate, fill out the ballot as to who you thought won, and turn that into class on Thursday. If you would like to take Communication Studies 75, which is our sports broadcasting class, just look around you. We have cameras over here. You can participate and take that class and be on television and also be, learn how to operate the TriCaster. We're just like ESPN, but for community colleges. So. This evening, I'd like to welcome David, who are, David Hayward, who is our first inter introductory speaker, who is going to be introducing inter duo interpretation. David Hayward is our first place winner in programmed oral interpretation, has just been on our team this year. Everybody who's competing this, uh, this evening were in your seats last spring. So you can do this, too, by joining our speech and debate team, Communication Studies 50. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome David Hayward. <laughs> Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Our first event this evening is Duo Interpretation. Now, this event is performance of literature where two people perform poetry, prose, and or drama to convey a central message to their audience. What separates this event from acting is that there are no props, the performers use a black book, and when there are multiple characters, the performers must make them distinct from one another as they are performing all the characters. Daphne Kuta and Caleb Henderson-Reed won first place with this program at the Northern California Forensics Association Spring Championship in February, and they will be performing this piece at the National Championship Tournament in Cleveland next month. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please give a warm round of applause to Daphne and Kayla. Shell gasoline, crack cocaine, Abu Ghraib, and nicotine. SUVs, handguns, and US magazine. Wait, don't you mean us magazine? That too. Swindling CEOs getting off clean? I, I think, think we're in trouble. trouble, don't you? In Barack Obama's Democratic Convention speech in 2004, he said that we are not just blue states. Or red states, we we're are the United, United states. states. Four years later, he was elected president and the country's become even more polarized. Some begin to question what the United States even means. For some, it meant you can walk through Target with guns hanging off your shoulder and no one would bother you. But for others, walking through a store with a gun meant you were the target. Arizona decided that law enforcement can ask for your papers. While Wall Street received more tax breaks than Main Street. 
The following dual interpretation explores what the United States means to us and what it might look like if you're on the outside looking in. Using lyrics from Stephen Lynch's America, Marvin Gaye's The Ecology Song, and Glory by Common and John Legend. And poetry This American Life by Phil Kay and Sarah Kay. The American Dream by Adam Melkor and American Dream by G. Amazawa, Paige Matam, Clint Smith, and Roscoe Burnham's. America. I awoke last night and heard my country singing songs like crooks. Not singing choruses, but singing hooks. Lean with it, vote for it. Lean with it, vote for it. Lean with it, vote, vote for, for it. it. Dig, boys, dig. It's just desert soil. Holes in the sand are good for graves and, and for oil. oil. Give me, give me more. Give me more. Give me, give me. And when we're done with them, we'll drop, drop them like they hide. Drop them like they hide. And I laid and listened to it. And in that chilling emptiness, even without pupils, my eye sockets could hear you all there. And I heard our childhood sympathies banging against, against each other in a giant communal eardrum circle, trying to drown out melodies we can't help but hum to. Because DJ Uncle Sam's been spinning worldwide. I mean, his chart's been on top since, since like 1945. We bring the Imperial back. Yup. The mother countries don't know how to act. Yup. But we'll make sure that we tell them that. Yup. Britain come over and pick up the slack. Yup. Take it to the bridge. It's collapsing on my back. And I wake on my knees begging, calling into that radio station to get a hold of that DJ that started it all. So he can change the song because I just want something I can dance to, but instead I change the station. Someone explain the difference between convicts in the prisons and victims of the system. Something, something is, is missing. missing. The commissioner is using people as commission. Change, change the, the station. station. We, we are the American dream. dream. I am the clean cut, clean shaven. Basement dwelling host teen living in a middle class curriculum. But I just can't seem to graduate. I speak freely. But make sure not to demonstrate. $17.76 to my name, but I saved it all for my woman. My sweet Sally Mae. I live in a classic American house. Why pick your best in front? With a four sale sign. Four bedroom, three bath, and two parents living inside. That are getting a divorce while they send their kids off to colleges that they, they can't, can't afford. afford. Change, Change the station. station. If you mix all the colors, you'll get brown. You mix all the cultures in this country of ours, and you'll get washed white. Just like me, Papa, who forgot his Spanish tongue to avoid elementary school fights. And just like my mother, who put a Christmas tree in front of her menorah every Hanukkah, because the sound of bricks in a Brooklyn Catholic neighborhood don't sound good breaking through glass. Now I can barely taste the Spanish on my tongue. Now I celebrate Christmas more with my Jewish side. Is, is this, this what America, America has become? become? Change, Change the station. station. This is the fruit of our founding fathers. But after strawberry season, we go president picking in November. It's the distraction that makes it hard for the masses to remember that the Declaration of Independence is dependent on race and gender. Mm, how ironic. We put Lincoln's face on the only corn with colored skin when white America did not prosper until it was colored in. But we all breathe the same. We must make dream catches of our hands, weaving our fingers like baskets of prayer. Whether it's poems, presidents, or, or pain, pain, being content is like, like taking naps in your own grave. Change, change the station. One day, when the glory comes, it'll be ours, it'll be ours. Oh, one day, when the war is won, we will be sure, we will be sure, oh, glory, 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 glory. Hands to the heavens, no man, no weapon. Formed against, yes, glory is destined. Every day women and men become legends. Sins that go against our skin become blessings. The movement is a rhythm to us. Freedom is like religion to us. Justice is just a position in us. Justice for all just ain't specific enough. One son died, his spirit is revisited in us. True and living, living in us. Resistance is us. That's why Rosa sat on the bus. That's why we walked through Ferguson with our hands up. When it go down, we woman and man up. They say stay down and we stand up. Shots we on the ground, the camera pan up. King pointed to the mountaintop and, and we ran, ran up. Change the station. The American dream is struggling. Change it. The American struggle is dreaming. Change it. The American dream is made of quicksand. The harder you fight, the further you'll bury. 
on the wasteland of the free, home of the brave, hand over your heart like a smallpox blanket. The American dream is institution. It is the immigrant experience or experience immigration. People are more concerned about my students being documented than they are about them being human. From Arizona's FB1070 to New York stop and frisk. America, America show us your papers who documented your dreams. dreams because the work of our hands and how we decide to shape this world is the deciding difference between drowning or dreaming. And when we finally reach the surface, that, that will be America's greatest nightmare. nightmare. Change the station. And I was searching for our justice, but I didn't know where to look. And I can't find it anywhere in this radio, so, so I, I keep digging. And I can't find it anywhere in my veins, so, so I, I keep, keep digging. digging. And there never seems to be enough oil or enough grace, so, so I, I keep, keep digging. digging. I'll dig till my arms disappear. And, and I'll dig with my throat. throat. I'll dig until it's just my toes. Just want to turn, turn that shit up before I go. You know what's a fun game? You listen to a song real tender. Oh, mercy, mercy. Got a shovel sitting here outside and a wide eyed conscience ready to play seeking harm. So, so we'll, we'll just do, do one more before we go. Land where my fathers died. The Chinese Exclusion Act. The 1790 Naturalization Act. Jim Crow laws. Land of the Pilgrim's Pride. The Indian Removal Act. Literacy tests. The 1907 Gentlemen's Agreement. From every mountainside. The Alien Sedition Act, the 1934 National Housing Act, the smallpox blankets, the war on terror, Executive Order 9066. Let freedom Welcome everyone. As a persuasive speaker, your goal is to provide the audience with a solution to a problem you address. It is an eight to 10 minute speech, which includes approximately eight to 10 sources that supports the argument the speaker is making. And as Aristotle said, must include ethos, logos, and pathos. To present the persuasive speech of the evening is Lucy Murillo. Lucy won first place at the NCFA Spring Championship Tournament and earned the right to represent Northern California in the oldest, most prestigious speech tournament in the United States. Without further ado, let's welcome Lucy Murillo. On September 4th, 2014, Sean Gruber a Caucasian police officer in South Carolina fired four shots at an African-American male after the man reached into his car to retrieve his driver's license. Fortunately, the dash camera on the patrol car clearly shows that Grubert had absolutely no need to use deadly force against Jones. Incidents like these are rarely reported, making it very easy for officers to claim the force was necessary. The ensuing plethora of similar news reports brought to the public's attention an undeniable racial element of Caucasian police officers allegedly wrongfully harming and sometimes killing ethnic minorities. American City and County on June 25, 2014, reported that occurrences like these spotlight the already widespread distrust between civilians and police officers. This problem must be remedied. And to do so, we must first examine the effects of the distrust in our law enforcement and discrimination within the legal system. Second, expose the causes. And finally, consider wearable cameras as a viable solution to this rising problem. The troublesome relationship between citizens and law enforcement is nothing new. According to the National Institute of Justice on January 27, 2015, Ethnic minority groups tend to have a more hostile attitude towards police officers. We cannot deny that racial discrimination has occurred within our criminal justice system and irrefutably still occurs today. For example, on August 9, 2014, MSNBC reported that St. Louis County
County Police Lieutenant Patrick Hayes encouraged his officers to target blacks. His exact words were, let's have a black day. Let's make the jail cells more colorful. Clearly, there is a disparity in how people of color are treated in comparison to non-minorities. According to Jeffrey Reinman in The Rich Get Richer and the Poor Get Prison, on October 11, 2014, numerous studies of police use of deadly force show that blacks and Latinos are considerably more likely than whites to be shot by the police. In addition, he says, African Americans are more likely to be arrested, indicted, convicted, and committed to an institution than are whites who commit the same offenses. In fact, according to a ProPublica analysis of federally collected data on fatal police shootings, on September 12, 2014, African American males are 21 times greater at risk to be the victims of police brutality. According to UPI News on October 11, 2014, a police officer who accused 43-year-old Eric Garner of selling unlicensed cigarettes put him in a chokehold from which he later died. On August 5, 2014, 22-year-old John Crawford was shot and killed by police inside his local Walmart in Ohio because a customer accused Crawford of walking around the store with a gun. Both men were African American, and both incidents were caught on camera. Unfortunately, the evidence is fragmented, as investigators had to piece video evidence together from several sources, which has led to an increased mistrust in law enforcement. The effects of inconsistent video evidence compounded by the mistrust in our justice system oblige us to uncover the causes. A major aspect in the lack of trust in police is that there is a disproportionate representation of minority police officers, which is evident when USA Today on January 21st, 2015 reported that three quarters of all police officers are Caucasian. Furthermore, most police departments lack racial diversity in communities whose populations are composed primarily of ethnic minority groups. Malcolm X noted that on his pilgrimage to Mecca, he saw pilots and police officers who looked like him and opined over what it would be like for blacks in his country to see people who held positions of authority who looked like he did. According to the New York Times on September 9, 2014, experts say that diversity in the police force increases their credibility with their community which is crucial for a well-functioning society. However, that is seldom the case. Take, for instance, Ferguson, Missouri, in which, according to NBC's Meet the Press on August 17, 2014, there are 50 white police officers, compared to only three black officers in a town whose inhabitants are 67% black. So when an incident occurs between a Caucasian police officer and an African-American suspect, as with the Michael Brown case, racial tensions are higher and racial divisions become more pronounced. Without a complete video recording or viable eyewitnesses, cases surrounding the use of deadly force by police become a he said, she said situation. And in the end, we run the risk of corrupt police officers not being reprimanded for their actions. On the other hand, police officers like Darren Wilson, who are carrying out their duties, may be accused of racism and unlawfully abusing their power. Thankfully, the Department of Justice on March 5, 2015, concluded that Officer Wilson lawfully performed his duties. The safety of both civilians and uniformed police officers is imperative, and thus requires some serious considerations of some solutions on both an institutional and individual level. We need to support a national movement of transparency in our legal system. To that end, police officers should be required to be equipped with wearable cameras. Wearable dime-sized cameras clip onto the collar of a shirt or onto the sides of glasses and provide a high-definition recording of anything in the officer's view. As soon as a police officer's shift begins, the camera must be turned on and must remain turned on until the end of their shift thus providing a full, unfragmented stream of video. These cameras will make identifying suspects exponentially easier, can aid police officers in rightly serving justice, and will, above all, provide accountability for the public and police officers. According to the previously cited New York Times, 
A year-long study conducted in the Rialto Police Department showed that with only half of the police force's officers wearing cameras at any given time, the department saw an 88% decrease in the number of complaints filed against police and a 60% decrease in the number of times police officers used force. These officers even gave positive feedback to wearing the cameras. Washington, D.C. Police Chief Kathy Lane, in an interview with the Washington Post on October 11, 2014, stated that she is in favor of wearable cameras, as it will make her department more transparent, will reduce the amount of supervisors have to spend investigating allegations, and will overall enhance police work, as recorded visual evidence is accurate, efficient, and objective on an institutional level. It is critical that our state governments make use of the $75 million in federal funding that President Obama has already allocated to outfit police officers with body cameras. I have drafted a letter ready for your signature that is meant to be sent to respective state senators, pleading that body cameras are implemented across the board. After the rounds, I will have them available for anyone who's willing to take the step towards positive change. On an individual level, our forensics teams and communities can help. According to the Wall Street Journal on August 20th, 2014, most wearable cameras range in price from three to $400 a piece. The president's plan will pay for half of the cost of cameras. Your team can, like ours did, donate a body camera to your local police department to help with the overall cost. There is no end all solution. However, this is literally the least we can do to help protect our law enforcement from being erroneously accused while protecting ourselves and others from the unlawful use of force or wrongful death at the hands of a police officer. Today, we have examined the effects of the distrust in our law enforcement, uncovered the causes behind such distrust before offering a solution that will hopefully bridge the gap of mistrust while cultivating a better rapport between civilians and law enforcement officials. Because as President Obama said in his State of the Union address on January 21st, 2015, surely we can understand a father who fears his son can't walk home without being harassed. And surely we can understand a wife who won't rest until the police officer she married walks through the front door at the end of his shift. Fortunately, Wearable cameras can ensure that when questionable situations arise, and they will, we won't have to ask what happened. Wearable cameras will show us what happened. and must perform them distinctly from one another and transition through them through each piece seamlessly, seamlessly. Caleb Henderson read one first place in this event at the 2015 Northern California Forensics Association Spring Championship Tournament hosted by City College of San Francisco in February. Please welcome Caleb. So I'm driving down the street with my four-year-old nephew he knocking back a juice box, me a Snapple. And today, y'all, we doing manly shit. I love watching the way his mind works. He asked me a million questions like, Uncle, why is the sky blue? Uncle, how do cars go? Uncle, why don't dogs talk? Uncle, 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 he asked. Uncle, uncle, as if his voice box is a warped record. I try my best to answer every question I do. I say, it's because the way the sun lights up the outer space. It's because the engines makes the wheels go. It's because their minds aren't quite like ours. I say yes, no, no, yes, no, yes, no, I don't know, who knows, maybe. We laugh. He smiles at me, looks out the window, spots a cop car, drops the seat, says, oh man, uncle, 5-0, we gotta hide. 
by giving my son this talk. And it terrifies me that in 2014, I text and call my son throughout the day. Not because I miss him so much, but because I'm checking on his safety in this racist, militaristic society. And that's why every group of black dudes should have at least one white guy in it. Hey, I'm serious for safety. Because <laughs> when shit go down, somebody gonna have to talk to the police. <laughs> I'm a white man. And part of the privilege that comes along with that fact is this. I know with something bordering on 100% certainty how my death will not be portrayed if I am shot and killed while walking down the street unarmed. In the aftermath of the grand jury decision in the Michael Brown shooting in Ferguson, Missouri on November 24, 2014, racial tensions were manifested in mass demonstrations and protests throughout the United States. This has led to some serious questions which include how to talk to children about race in this country. Some parents believe that children are too young to talk about race and racism. However, Jennifer Adair, professor of early childhood education, said to the Huffington Post on October 14th that parents of color do it all the time. The following program, Oral Interpretation, offers some insight into conversations about race in households like mine. In Poetry, Because He's Black by Javon Johnson. Drama, Killing Them Softly by Dave Chappelle. Prose Piece, I Hope My Son Stays White by Calvin Hinnick. And What Black Parents Tell Their Kids About Policy by Jasmine Hughes. Don't shoot. I'll be honest, I'm not happy with the way we raise our black boys. Don't like the fact that he learned how to hide from cops well before he knew how to read angrier that his survival depends more on his ability to deal with authorities than it does his own literacy. It was the last day of school when I was walking with my daddy preparing to leave. And then suddenly he paused and he looked at me intently. He said, son, you are a black male. That's already two strikes against you. To the general public, anything I did will be perceived as malicious and deserving of severe punishment. I had to govern myself accordingly. I was seven years old. And that's when your white friend come in handy. Because anytime some shit go down with the police, you could be like, uh, uh oh, Ernie, Ernie, wanna get this one? Do something. <laughs> See? Black people, we just very afraid of the police. It's a big part of our culture. Don't matter how rich you are, how old you are, just afraid of them. I mean, like, you a white lady, you ever been pulled over by the cops? And what they say to you? Let me see your driver's license and your registration. See? See, I'm just guessing. That's not what they say to us. You wouldn't believe what they say to us. Get up! In this car, in this family, we are not afraid of the law. I wonder if he can hear the uncertainty in my voice. Is today the day that he learns that uncle was willing to lie to him? That I'm more human than hero? We both know the truth is far more complex than do not hide. Both know too many black boys who've disappeared, names lost. Know too many Trayvon Martins, Oscar Grants, and Abner Luimas. Know too many Sean Bells and Amadou Diallos. Know too well that we are the hard-boiled sons of Emmett Till. Every black male I've ever met has had this talk. And it's likely that I have to give it one day, too. There's so many things I need to tell my little boy before he even born, like, don't wear a hoodie. Don't you try and break up that fight. Don't talk back to them cops. But it's all variations of a single theme. Don't give them an excuse to kill you. I want my son's skin color not to matter, but the truth is that it does. If he gets darker and his skin eventually comes to resemble my wife's more than mine, there's gonna be consequences for him. People will start to fear him. Not everybody, but plenty of people. And he'll never know until it's too late. It'll only be worse if he wears a hoodie or sags his pants. And so, so shamefully, I'll always hope that he'll be culturally white, following the trends of the suburbs and never the inner city. And I was hanging out with a friend of mine, you know, he's a white guy. We was lost in the city, we was hanging out, we was smoking a joint. Uh, I don't know if it was a coincidence or we was lost and high as shit, but you know, my white friend, he was smoking a joint. He look over and he see the cops. Dave, Dave, it's the goddamn cops. I'm gonna go ask him for directions. I was like, Tim, no, don't do it, but it was too late. That man was high as shit, he was walking over there. Uh, excuse me, uh, excuse me. He started touching the officer, uh, excuse me, I need some information. Started confessing things he should confess. I'm a little high. <laughs> all I wanna know, all I wanna know is which way is Third Street? I was like, hey, take it easy. 
you're on Third Street. You better be careful. Now go ahead and move it, move it. That's all that happened, that's the end of the story. Now I know that's not amazing to some of y'all in here, but you ask one of these black fellas in the room, that shit is incredible. A black man would never dream of talking to the police high. That is a waste of weed. <laughs> we both know it's not about whether or not the shooter is racist. It's about how poor black boys are treated as problems well before they're treated as people. Black boys in this country can't afford to play cops and robbers if we're always considered the latter. Don't have the luxuries of playing war when we're already in one. And where I'm from, seeing cop cars drive down the street feels a lot like low flying planes in New York City. Where I'm from, seeing routine traffic stops feels a lot like minefields and any wrong move could very well mean your life. And how do I look my nephew in his apple face and tell him to be strong when we both know that black boys are murdered every single day simply for standing up for themselves. Now I didn't think nothing of it. I was like, damn, Chip, you got lucky. But then there was another time we was in New York and my boy Chip was driving, he was drunk. What, don't look at me like that. Now, I know, I usually don't let my friends drive drunk, but uh, I was smoking a joint so I couldn't really say shit to the guy. <laughs> so anyway, Chip look over, he see another car. He's like, Dave, Dave, I'm gonna race him. Man, that light turned green and Chip took off. He was zigzagging and shit so the other car couldn't catch him. Other dude didn't even know he was racing. <laughs> then a cop came behind us and pulled us over. Now imagine I'm scared as hell right now. Car smell like weed, Chip is drunk, I'm black, we going to jail. <laughs> Chip was not scared at all. So officer walk up, this is almost exactly what Chip did. Hello, officer. Did you know you were racing that car back there? Ugh. Sorry, officer. I didn't know I couldn't do that. Well, now you know. Now you know. So get out of here. Get the fuck out of here. Thank you, officer. Mm. <laughs> what? What, Dave? I didn't know I couldn't do that. I was shocked. I was like, a black man would never think to say something like that. Because every cop out there, they know we know the law. I guarantee you, every black person in this room is a qualified paralegal. We know the laws <laughs> and the penalties. So I take him by the hand and I say, be strong. Be kind and polite. Know your laws. Be aware of how quickly your hand moves to pocket for wallet. Be more aware of how quickly that officer's hand moves to holster for gun. Be black, be a boy, and have fun, because this world will force you to become a man far more quickly than you'll ever need to. But then he lets go of my hand, he says, but uncle, uncle, what happens if that cop is really mean? And it scares me to know that he, like so many other black boys, is getting ready for a war that I can't prepare him for. So that's why my kids will get all the talks. I teach them to respect the law and the people tasked to uphold it, but to be wary of them as well, because they steal people too, fault people. I teach them that hate has many forms, but to speak out when their rights is being violated and to treat every injustice with the incredulity that it deserves. And this conversation is part of the reason why before my son was born, I'd hoped he'd be a girl. I've never been a black man in America, so I can't tell him what it's like. I do know that much of society is still terrified of black males, but my son's blackness only presents a danger to himself. The more he looks like his father, the safer he's gonna be. Informative speaking is an eight to 10 minute speech in which the speaker's purpose is to give the audience news that we can use while amusing and hopefully amazing us. For those of you in Communication One classes, note the structure, content, delivery, and how the sources are cited within the speech. Remington Green is a 2015 California State Silver Medalist in informative speaking, 
and will be representing Solano at our national championship tournament in Cleveland in two weeks. Please welcome Remington Green. Chef Anthony Bourdain, in a show, No Reservations, on the Travel Channel, travels the world introducing his viewers to different culinary experiences. From blood cake in London to avian sphincter muscle in Korea. Yes, it's exactly what you think it is, and no, it's not quite finger licking good. <laughs> but what Bourdain teaches us is food is everything we are. It's an extension of nationalist feeling, ethnic feeling, your personal history, your province, your region, your tribe, even your grandma. On one of his travels, Bourdain encounters a delicacy in Zhengdu, China. That's 67% protein, 18% fat, and 100% cricket. Gorillus binaculatus, to be exact. This new, sustainable source of protein is edging its way in the West between casein and soy, in all shapes and forms. In fact, crickets are being used to make everything from pancakes and muffins to protein smoothies and tortilla chips. But the best thing about crickets is that they're easy on the planet. According to The Guardian, on July 15, 2014, an Ohio-based startup aims to introduce Americans to what two billion people worldwide already believe, that crickets can be a delicious, inexpensive, and environmentally friendly source of protein. Using substantially less land and water than livestock, <coughs> crickets also emit significantly less greenhouse gases. Therefore, let's begin with an appetizer on the production of crickets. Second, serve your main course on the uses of crickets before rounding off our meal with a dessert full of the implications of this crunchy cousin of the grasshopper. Native Americans have a long history of eating insects. According to Nature Education on June 6, 2014, as Western cultures began to interact, the West began imposing their own values onto the crickets, discouraging and suppressing the practice. See, in their eyes, eating insects is considered primitive. Though most Westerners still turn their noses up at the idea of eating these small, six-legged creatures, the scientist on February 1st, 2014 notes that crickets have numerous attributes that make them highly attractive sources of protein. Ohio-based cricket farmer Kevin Vancouver tells New York Times in an interview on August 14th, 2014 that not only are crickets delicious, but the process of making them is simple. On his farm, which is similar to most, he houses about 3,000 crickets in large trucks in about a 5,000 square foot warehouse, where it keeps a temperature of approximately 80 to 90 degrees. And for all of those of you who need free range, grass fed, no hormones added ingredients, you'll be pleased to find that crickets actually live a good life. They're fed organic feed and the freshest of vegetables. And when the good and fat computer says, he puts them into a coffee freezer, which induces a state of hibernation, except they never wake up. Approximately two pounds of feed and one gallon of water will produce one pound of crickets. According to Food Republic on April 1st, 2014, in a 24 square foot space in just an eight week span, farms like the Hoovers produces 6,250 pounds of crickets. Having tasted our sample on the production of crickets, let's delve into our main course on the uses of crickets. Bugs aren't anything we haven't eaten before. Interestingly enough, there are approximately 5 billion people who are not fond of eating insects yet are insect eaters. Albeit unknowingly to the tune of two pounds of flies, maggots, and other insects each year. Even more fascinating is that they are a part of our everyday lunch and dinner, and the FDA knows all about it. In fact, the FDA reported on its website on June 10, 2014, that it allows for a small amount of harmless but unavoidable defects in processed foods, including insect parts, larva eggs, and insect sacs. Now, crickets come from the ground, the earth. They're used and harvested in various ways. According to Slate.com, September 11, 2014, crickets are a protein powder source that supply a complete amino acid profile, which are all nine essential amino acids required for human nutrition. And not only are these little guys packed with protein, they've got B12, iron, zinc, 
potassium, calcium, and magnesium. And if you're feeling a little queasy over the idea of eating insects straight, there are plenty of other ways to eat them without actually feeling like you're eating bugs, which could be a great tool for parents who need to get more protein into their children's diets. Now, they've already lied to us about putting vegetables in our dinners, but imagine cookies made with cricket flour. The previously cited New York Times conducted an interview with Joanne Miller, the owner of Vinnie Foods, an online cookie company where she and other American entrepreneurs in her field believe that crickets are poised to ignite a food craze. Because cricket flour is packed with protein and other nutritional benefits, it is the key to a sustainable future because it requires much less food, water, space, land, and time than traditional livestock. Plus, they're already being raised for pet food. Now, farmers like Kevin Bukuber are raising them for human consumption. They eat well, process well, are easy to care for, and are nutritional powerhouses. To that end, restaurant owners Greg Suits and Gabby Lewis have decided to develop their own cricket bars and other edible delights that are delicious and equally beneficial. According to an interview with NPR on August 22nd, 2014, Suits and Lewis's philosophy begins with packaging that doesn't include an image of a single cricket. Same mentality goes for not thinking of soy when you eat a soy-based protein bar. Protein from insects has one of the least environmental impacts on the world and is a viable long-term solution to meeting protein needs in an overpopulated world, which, according to Pew Research on February 3rd, 2014, is supposed to reach 9.6 billion by 2050. The main course on the uses of crickets was filling, but I've saved just enough room for a dessert full of the implications that crickets have on our future and our environment. Over the years, climate change has reduced agricultural productivity. Overfishing has dwindled freshwater resources, and pollution from pesticides and fertilizers, along with a host of other factors, have all led to food scarcity in many parts of the world. According to the United Nations website, last accessed September 12, 2014, Two of the United Nations eight Millennium Developmental Goals as of September 2014 is to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger and reduce child mortality rates by expanding the consumption of edible insects. The aforementioned Scientist magazine states that humans currently consume 40% of potential terrestrial productivity, 30% of which is used to pasture and feed livestock. Now, crickets don't take up much space nor do they require as much food compared to cows who need approximately eight grams of feed to gain one gram of weight, while crickets only need two grams of feed to gain one gram of weight. As it turns out, there are approximately two billion people who actively consume insects as part of their daily diets. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, for example, caterpillars are abundantly available all year round in markets, while in other African countries, insects are mostly eaten by the natives. And in Southeast Asia, a plethora of insects prepared and concocted in different ways are constantly being marketed to tourists. Consider caramel glazed cricket crunch coated flan. <coughs> I know what you're thinking. Ew, flan. Caterpillars, bees, and other insects may be delicacies now, but in the future, they may become a food staple to you and I. Today, we've hopefully gained an appetite for a different kind of food product by taking a bite into the production of crickets, enjoying a second helping on the uses of crickets, before cleansing our palates with the benefits of this delectably crunchy treat. We may be running out of space, and the climate may force us to reconsider other forms of nourishment. Insects, like crickets, could be colorful, flavorful additions to our plates. Bon appétit. How's everyone doing? Yeah. Very good. Thank you everybody for coming out. Uh, this is our last event for you. We got debate coming up next. Uh, you'll just have a quick debate and we'll get you out of here. Real quick fun fact while they're setting up. My father claims to have started speech night 44 years ago. He's a professor at Diablo Valley College for 44 years. And it was a way, they originally started as a way for likable slackers to earn enough extra credit so they could actually graduate and pass the class. Uh, so I wanted to thank, first of all, all you uh, people that need to earn extra credit, or else we wouldn't be able to have tonight, so thank you very much for supporting us. Alright, so thank you everybody. Uh, shout out to my classes, by the way, all my students out there. Uh,
Yeah, thank you. My name is Darren Phelan. I'm uh, one of the coaches, along with Anna Patero, uh, and a professor here as well. Thank you so much, everybody. Let's get into what we're doing next. Next, we have parliamentary debate. And it is modeled after British parliamentary system of debate, which is practiced in their House of Commons. It began in the collegiate area in 1994. There's two teams. You'll have the government team on one side over here, uh, then you'll have the opposition team as well. Uh, for the government, you have two speakers, the prime minister and the member of government. And for the opposition, we have two speakers as well. You'll have the leader of opposition, and then you'll also have the member of opposition. So with no further ado, I'm gonna bring out the debaters. Last thing, and then you're free to get out of here. Thanks again, everybody. So first off, our debaters this evening, representing the government, is gonna be Destiny Smith and Caleb Henderson Red, who you've all seen before. Awesome. They actually were drawn bronze medalists at the state tournament that was just hosted in Southern California by Moore Park College. They're an awesome debate team, and this is actually their first year doing this. They'll be even better, and they're both back next year, which is awesome for me. <laughs> yes. Uh, next we got next we got the loyal opposition team. We have Brad Larson and Alice Hoover coming out next. Good luck, have fun. There we go. Uh, Alice actually is a bronze medalist in Lincoln Douglas debate. Uh, awesome, yes. And she actually won a gold the year before in Lincoln Douglas debate. Brad Larson also took a bronze medalist, or sorry, took a silver medalist at the state tournament in 2004 as well. So please welcome our debaters as they discuss. The topic for tonight is going to be legalization of prostitution. Yes, good luck. So first we'll have the first speaker. This speech will be about four minutes. Each person will get a present and then they'll do quick rebuttals and we'll get you out of here. Thanks again, everybody. Enjoy. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you everybody for being here. I'm gonna start my timer. Okay, so today we are talking about this house should legalize prostitution. So this is going to be a policy round because of the term should in the resolution. And the uh, criterion that we're gonna be looking for is net benefits. So we're weighing the advantages towards the disadvantages. And uh, let's see, some quick definitions. This house is going to be the state of California and everything else is contextual. I think you guys can figure out what legalizing prostitution means. Okay, looking at our, um, some background of illegal prostitution is currently the longest running profession. It's a $14.6 billion market industry in the United States alone. And it's currently putting men and women behind bars for victimless crimes as well as preventing prostitutes from accessing justice. So our plan is that California will legalize prostitution through issuing brothel licenses. The agent is the California state legislator, the enforcement and funding are both normal means. So let's get right into advantage number one, which is decreasing crime. Business Insider has found that in San Francisco, 82% of prostitutes have been sexually assaulted 68% have been raped, and a woman in San Francisco, who's my same age, my same race, but a prostitute, is 18 times more likely to be murdered than I am. That's 18 times more likely. Our second harm here is that this violence against prostitutes is going unchecked. Because for a prostitute to go and report any of these crimes being committed against them, they will then be prosecuted as a prostitute. So this is allowing the crimes against them to continue and they have no access to our justice system. Our harm number three is that both prostitutes and sex trafficking victims are being prosecuted for sex crimes. So even people that are in the sex trafficking industry, when the police find them, they don't know yet if they've been forced or not forced and they have to go through the criminal system before that can be determined whether or not it was by their own violation or whether or not they were forced to commit those instances. So this is causing even more traumatization to people who are already victims and it's all because prostitution is currently illegal. So our solvency is that by creating um, uh, the legalization of prostitution in California through brothel licenses, then we're now giving access to justice for these prostitutes and these victims of assault and these women who are being murdered, that they can then call out at the first sign of violence and call out for the police to step in and protect them. 
And um, an additional impact is that we're going to see an increase in health because right now, condoms are what police are using to prosecute the prostitute and the John or the customer. And so uh, the prostitutes are being told not to use condoms, which is obviously causing them and the John to then be uh, able to get an STD and then transfer that to other people. However, with the legalization, those uh, the licenses are requiring that the prostitutes use condoms and the prostitutes will now, I mean, who doesn't want to, who wants to get an STD, right? So now they can use the condom without the John saying, no, 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 I don't want to get sent to jail. So this is an additional impact is the increase in health. And another impact is that it's going to free up law enforcement to be able to focus on the actual victims. It frees up the law enforcement to go after sex trafficking instead of having to waste time and putting men and women that are willing, there's no victim in the crime, and putting them in jail. It frees up our law enforcement. Now, looking at a second advantage, it's going to be an increase in tax revenue. So currently, um, it's a $14.6 billion industry where none of that money is being taxed, none of it is being funneled back into um, the United States. California alone had a $5.8 billion tax cut to education. So that's $5.8 billion that California has lost in education. So if we are able to legalize prostitution, that gives us that tax revenue coming in. And um, it also an additional impact is that when these prostitutes are being prosecuted, they have a criminal record, which means that when they want to go and seek actual employment that's legal right now, they can't do that because of their criminal record. So in legalizing prostitution, if they decide that they want to go and look at other job opportunities, those job opportunities are open to them, which also gives us tax revenue from their other employment. Thank you. disadvantage titled Increased Human Trafficking. Now the link here is that a 2012 study in the world development analyzed 116 countries and showed that countries with legalized prostitution have higher rates of human trafficking. Now there are currently 1 million people in the United States alone being caught in these human trafficking operations and these numbers are only increasing according to the CIA. The brink here is that democracies and countries with um, higher incomes actually have a higher propensity to have more human trafficking when they legalize prostitution. As the United States is doing better than other countries economically and we are a democracy, we're even more likely to have these problems increase. Not only that, but California is currently the top destination for human trafficking in the entire United States, according to the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. What this means is that if California was to legalize prostitution, this would significantly increase the number of individuals who are caught in human trafficking operations. The impact of this is that we're going to have an increase of human trafficking. More people are going to be caught and forced into these labor and sexual situ situations that they don't want to be in. Not only that, but a lot of these individuals, according to the US State Department, half of the victims of the, all the federal cases are under 18. So we're going to see an increase of not only women and men being caught into human trafficking, but also children. When we look to this case, there's no reason to pass this plan if it's going to increase the number of people who are being caught in human trafficking operations. Not only that, but let's look at a second disadvantage, titled Increasing Human Rights Abuses. Now, according to the Psychiatric Times, regardless of legal status, Prostitution is still very dangerous for individuals who are involved in it. There has been high instances of homicide, rape, and physical assault for individuals who are prostitutes, whether it's legal or not. The second link here is that 80% of legal prostitutes say that they want to get out, specifically in Nevada, which is the only state in the United States that has prostitution legalized where a lot of these people actually want to get out and they're going to be forced into being subjected into more of these problems, that's a specific issue. We're going to see more human rights abuse under that. The brink here is that only 10% of all prostitutes in Nevada are illegal. 90% of all of the prostitutes in Nevada are illegal and not following the rules of the brothels, meaning there's high rates of actual assault against these women and men, and there's high rates of not using condoms, and there's no real safety checks for them. 
Not only that, but 58% of prostitutes report violent assaults against them. The impact to this, if we allow prostitution to be legalized, we're going to see an increased rise in human rights abuses because the majority of these prostitution rings are going to be illegal. So there's going to be no regulation. There's going to be a lot of assault. And let's be real, if you had the choice to go to a illegal prostitute who was cheaper or a legal prostitute who was more expensive because of all these regulations, most people would probably pick the cheaper option. And <laughs> so these are all reasons we don't want to be voting for the planet. But let's go briefly to the advantages. Now their first advantage is that they're going to decrease crime. But when we look specifically to Nevada, where 90% of the prostitution is actually illegal and doesn't follow any regulations, we can see the same trend is going to happen in California. Not only that, but we can look to Australia as well, where illegal brothels increased 300% after they legalized prostitution. We see when you legalize prostitution, there is an increase in the amount of illegal operations that are going on. So we're going to see more crime and more assaults going on because another study which looked at five countries, including brothels and legal ones, said that there was no protection in these rooms for the women and 80% suffered physical violence against them. So we see there's going to actually be an increase of crime because people will be committing these travesties against them. Not only that, but looking at tax revenue. Well, while it might raise a little bit of money, let's be real, money never goes to education, even when we're saving it. As much as we might all wish that happens, our government doesn't seem to think education is important or put as much money towards it as I think all of us in college would hope. And when we look to increasing a little bit of money versus harming thousands of people, we need to be voting against this plan. Thank you. Okay, so for everybody flowing this, I'm going to be going off case, and then I'll go on case. So I'm going to their their uh, their plan disadvantages, and then I'll go to advantages. Okay, so the first thing I want to say is that Terrence Howard said in his movie Hustle and Flow that it was hard out here for a pimp. But I'm gonna show you guys why it's harder for prostitutes in our society and why prostitution should be legalized. So going on to the first thing that they talked about was in their disadvantage, they said there's gonna be an increase in human trafficking and that countries uh, with legalized prostitution, human trafficking rates go up. Well, I have a study, according to Antelope's PhD um, at Stanford. She said sex work is a legitimate work and problems within the industry are not inherent in the work itself. It is the vulnerability, not the sex work, which creates victims. Sex workers should enjoy the same labor rights as others. So when they get up here and talk about that sex workers or prostitutes don't have, uh, these things are gonna happen, these bad things are gonna happen if we legalize prostitution, they said they're gonna increase human trafficking and all these things. Well, I wanna say in response to that is that uh, our government system, America, has a more advanced security in order to deal with this situation. If we do the brothel licensing, like they didn't talk about in Nevada, how the brothels uh, issue weekly STD tests and things so that people can't get, people can't have these situations happen to them. And if we get these brothels in California, then it's gonna be resolving this issue. The problem is the vulnerability. It's the fact that that pimp is in, intimidating that prostitute and making her become that. That's why they wanna get out. But if it's a profitable business and they're raising their children and doing things that they need to do and taking care of business with uh, using prostitution, then they have every right to sell their body because it's their body and they can do what they want with it. So moving on to the next thing that they said, uh, they said California is the top destination for human trafficking. And I wanna point out that that's because prostitution is illegal right now in California. So they have no one to run to. They have no one to say, you know what, my pimp just beat me and how can I do something because I'm gonna face prosecution as well. They're facing the same prosecution that, that people without rights are having to deal with. And they're, and they're, they should have these rights because all they're doing is trying to make a living and trying to do their own work. And when did we as Americans take away the right for people to start doing their own work, for them to start making their responsibilities and making things happen in, their, in our society? 
They're trying to be productive members of our society so they can get money, so they can have an education. I want to talk about Marilyn Monroe, one of the most famous prostitutes, or maybe prostitute, that we all know. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe put herself through acting school by using prostitution before she was a, an, an official actor. And by doing that, she was able to accomplish many things. And you know, we all know her. Uh, some of you know her as the guy, the girl that slept with Kennedy, but many of us know her as a great actor, um, or maybe not so great. So moving on to this advantage too. They said it's still very dangerous whether it's legal or not. And I want you to go ahead and use that example that I talked about, that the, the danger is coming from the vulnerability. It's coming from them not having that, that protection that they can have. But our plan advocates for legalizing prostitution so that we can get them rights, so that they can be protected by our constitution, and they can be safe in our environment. And that's the main thing that you guys need to be looking at here. When legalizing prostitution, we need to consider the fact that these people are doing whatever it takes in order to, to survive. Some of these people don't have food in their fridges. Some of these people don't have uh, uh, clothes for their kids' backs, places to live. But these people are making a living by selling their body. Now, if that's what you want to do, then it should be your right to do that. Because in America, we are a free country. So I'm going to be moving on to our advantages and telling you why you should be voting for us. The first part, we talked about... Um, when, when San, we use the example of when San Francisco, uh, they, when prostitution is illegal, you see a lot of things like increased rape, increased sexual assault, and all these things happening. They said that Nevada is 90% illegal, and then they talked about how things are going wrong in Nevada. Now, like I, go ahead and use the example that I said our protection system is more advanced. We have the right, we have the tools and the capability in order to solve these problems more efficiently than these other countries they use, like Australia. The next thing I'm gonna be moving on to is our second advantage of tax revenue. She said money never goes to education. Well, at least the money can be back in our economy so we can do something with it instead of being on the black market. I'd rather have the money be shoveled back into our gross domestic product and actually raise some things in our system like education because according to a study that says when legalizing prostitution, we can get the workers the rights they deserve and that GDP factors in the value of labor, it also factors in going towards our education. So you can see, when we raise our gross domestic product in California, it's gonna help our education out. Go ahead and vote government. Thank everyone once again for coming out here tonight. Glad you could make it. Um, go ahead and go on case and then off case for anyone who's flowing. All right. Go. All right, so Caleb gets up here and says a lot of pretty words, you know, makes some jokes. He's a personable guy. But that doesn't mean that he's right. And I'm getting to exactly how wrong he is just now. He comes up here and says in Advantage 1 that uh, this rape is because, you know, it's illegal in this area and that we can actually protect these prostitutes if we legalize. However, you can cross apply this directly to the stats that we give you that state that if we legalize it, it's going to increase illegal prostitution as well. So at the point, of the, at the, at the point where we're increasing illegal prostitution by increasing legal prostitution, we can see that all of these harms that he states about legal, illegal prostitution are just going to continue and get even worse. So we can see that you know, he has no real um, points here. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, we can see that uh, brothels in Australia actually increased 300% after it was legalized, and that's illegal brothels. So that's a 300% increase in illegal prostitution directly correlated to legalizing prostitution. All right, so moving on. Um, furthermore, he states that we have protection in these legal brothels, that these girls are, you know, they're nice and safe there. Well, let me let you know what goes on in these legal brothels. These legal brothels. These women are held, locked in their rooms, similarly to a jail cell, and they're only allowed out to eat, sleep, and go to the bathroom. And the fact of the matter is, they're locked in these places for 15 days, working 14-hour workdays. I mean, can you imagine that? Being locked in a room that you have to work in, and the type of work that you're doing, for 15 days straight, doing 14-hour workdays. That's just ridiculous. Furthermore, he goes on to state an advantage too, that this money can go back into our economy. Well, let's look at exactly how much money that uh, Nevada is gaining from this. Through their legal prostitution, they gain about $75 million per year. And, you know, that might sound like a lot of money, but if it comes down to actually funding things, it costs a hell of a lot more than that. We can see that we recently spent, like, $3.8 billion on an F-13 fighter jet project that failed. So we're actually just throwing money into this thing. That's $3.2 billion versus $75 million. And they're saying that we just got a $5.8 billion cut in education. I mean, 75 million compared to 5.8, it's just a drop in the bucket. 
And when it comes down to it, we should be valuing these women's lives more than you know, gaining a little bit of money. So, now that I've destroyed on case, let's go ahead and move off case. So first of all, on the disadvantage one, he says that, you know, this PhD says that these people should have the right to work for themselves. And I totally agree with that. You know, they should be able to work. But the fact of the matter is they shouldn't be working in these brothels that are basically like prisons and they're basically used as sex slaves even though it is legal. And the fact that it is legal just makes it worse. So moving on, he says that it's licensing and the STD test, it makes these women nice and healthy. However, the Johns don't need to take tests, and there are ways to spread STDs with the use of a condom. So we can see that this has actually increased the rate of HIV in Australia since it's been passed in women by 91%. A 91% increase in HIV. And he's trying to tell you that this is safe. I mean, I'm not buying that at all. All right, so moving on, um, disadvantage two. It says that because prostitution is illegal in California, that uh, these women have like no other options. But I mean, uh, let's look at some statistics based on legal prostitution here. 60% of these women are actually child sex slaves that were abducted and taken to these legal brothels and have been being uh, prostituted legally there even though they were underage. One prostitute owner even bragged about having a 12-year-old mentally disabled child that she abducted and was using as a prostitute until she was 22 years of age. And this, when these women aren't seeing much of the profits that are coming from these brothels. They, are, they receive less than 80% of what they get. And the fact of the matter is, even taxi drivers receive 30% of their income if they drive the John to the place. I mean, that's 30% right out of their pocket right there. So we can see this isn't a living wage for these prostitutes. So moving on, it says it's a free country and that they should be able to do what they want. I agree with that, it is a free country. But because it's a free country, they should also be allowed to not be sexually assaulted and not be exposed to this sort of behavior and this sort of abuse. The fact of the matter is, if we legalize prostitution, it's gonna to lead to more illegal prostitution, as well as worse treatment for everyone involved in both legal and illegal prostitution, as well as more children getting abducted, more children being forced into this, uh, these sex acts. So with that, you have no choice but to vote opposition. Director of Women's Studies at the Rhode Island University said it best, legalizing prostitution will not make abuses end. It will only legalize abuses and increase the violence and exploitation of these individuals. We can look specifically to the fact that we give you study after study showing how individuals and countries that actually legalize prostitution have increased rates of human trafficking. Caleb does a great job kind of arguing this, but at the end of the day, we look at over 116 countries that shows you that no matter what you do, no matter what state you are in, when you legalize prostitution, you increase the number of human trafficking victims there are out there, which increases the number of people who are being kidnapped and taken from their homes, being forced into doing physical labor or sexual labor against their will. These are things that we do not want to happen, especially for just a little bit of extra money, like Bradley points out. Now, this is the main reason that you need to vote opposition, because nobody wants to see the people that they love being taken from their homes and being forced into these terrible situations. The next reason that you're voting for us is because this is going to increase human rights abuses. Brad does a great job of pointing out how a lot of brothels don't even follow the rules. Can you imagine what it would be working 15 days in a row, 14 hour workdays, not being let out except to eat, go to the bathroom, and a few other things? That is terrible. Not only that, but 80% of these women and men who are in these prostitution rooms, even the legal ones, have reported physical violence against them, whether it's from the runners or the individuals who are being serviced. Um, regardless, they're having assault against them. And so you need to be voting for the opposition because we don't want to see these women and men being abused more than they already are. At the end of the day, there is only going to be an increase of crime, violence, and human trafficking for a little bit of money that's really only a drop in the bucket and not going towards our education. We need to protect these individuals, and that is the reason that you're voting for opposition tonight. Thank you. Okay, so the reason you're voting for the government is because the opposition has described to you the status quo. 
The status quo is that we have sex trafficking, we have human trafficking, we have prostitutes being beaten. And the facts, the statistics, is that a prostitute my same age and race is 18 times more likely to be murdered. And that currently she has no access to justice. That currently the prostitutes that are stuck in a room for 15 days straight have no one to turn to for help. They cannot go to the police and say, hey, guess what, I'm being held against my will. They have no labor board to go to and say that I'm working a whole 15 days in a row, I'm not getting an eight hour work day. Right now, we have rights. We have employment rights where we can go and say when our boss isn't giving us our 15 minute break when we've been serving food all day. But right now, the prostitutes do not have access to those rights. They do not have access to go and say, hey, my pimp is beating me and I'm afraid for my life. I'm afraid for my child's life because they're threatening them too. They can't do that because if they go to the police, then they're thrown in jail and then their children are left all alone with no food and no one to take care of them. That's why you're voting for the government today. It's because we're giving prostitutes the human rights that the opposition is talking about. Right now, the prostitutes don't have those human rights. They're not being given to them by our justice system, which is why we're saying that the state of California will legalize prostitution by giving brothel licenses so these prostitutes have access to employment. They have access to the rights that any of us have as being an employee of this, through the state of California and they have protection by our police. So instead of getting thrown into jail when their pimp beat them up, instead of that then they can then get the pimp thrown into jail and they can get the help they need. Thank you. Thank you, debaters. Good job. All right, this is the part where you get to participate. We're going to let you vote for who you think was the winner. What I'll do is I'll uh, pick out a team, get as loud as you want for whoever you thought won. So first off, again, we have the government team over here, and then we have opposition. If you think the government team won, make some noise. <laughs> How about make some noise for the opposition team if you think they won? I don't know, we're gonna do that one more time. Make some noise for the government team. One last time, make some noise for the opposition team. All right, we got the winner tonight. Pretty clear vote, government team. Make some quick announcements, get you out of here. Thank you so much, all the debaters. Great debate. I want everyone to stay out here. I'm actually going to call the whole team out. You guys can hang out here. Can the rest of the team that's back there come on out? We got other people coming on up. Come on up. Thank you, Rodney. Jenny, hello. These were the other people helping out tonight. All right, so here's our uh, 2015. Solano speech and debate team representing Solano and Nationals in a couple weeks in Brooklyn. Just want to say thank you so much for the support. Thank you for coming out and helping us. I just want you to know, you know, the funding, we don't get a ton of funding out here, so doing this is a great way for us to be able to go to Cleveland, Ohio and represent uh, Solano Community College, represent California. So thank you so much. Everyone have a great night. Thank you so much to the broadcasting class. Palm 75, check it out. Everyone have a great one, take care.